Okay, I'm here to talk about the future of AI hardware. Uh, we've already had two fantastic speakers who's kind of taking you to the deep end. Maybe you're a little sleepy, maybe you got lost somewhere in the depths of the IPU graphs. They're kind of mesmerizing. So I'll try to pull you back out, and uh, Simon's laughing, and, and maybe give a broader picture. Um, we are kind of, ARC is on the investing side, so we're trying to figure this out um, from a very top level to figure out where it's investable, where the world is headed. Um, so this will be the first, perhaps, neutral or industry view of uh, AI hardware. Okay. So a little bit about ARK Invest. We are a startup as well. Uh, we were founded in 2014 based in New York. And our purpose really is very simple. It's to give public uh, investors a chance to invest in all the great disruptive technologies that you're hearing about here today uh, at ACOGX. If you follow Azeem's excellent newsletter, you probably are very passionate and exciting about all the things that are changing in AI, blockchain, cloud computing. Um, and most of that you hear a lot through the venture world. And uh, most people cannot really invest with Sequoia um, or Lux or some uh, venture fund. But there are great companies in the public today doing artificial intelligence. Um, and most financial products are not really geared to help you invest in those things. So we created a number of ETFs, uh, three main strategies, one on next generation internet, which I focus on, one on automation and transport, where autonomous driving and robots are really making huge waves across the world, and the last one on genomics and digital health, which is really, I think, some of the most exciting areas right now that's happening, being able to map the human genome and applying a lot of the intelligence to help us uh, coming up with next generation therapies. We started in 2014 and was pretty quiet, uh, but uh, as, of, as of 2018, we have about five billion in assets uh, under, uh, under management. And you can learn more about uh, us on our website. So um, this, this segment, this, this track really is about AI hardware. So why do we need AI hardware? Um, I think the previous speakers have really made a good case for it, but here is one uh, way to look at it that perhaps makes it uh, even more stark. This is from OpenAI. They've done some great work on kind of tracking the progress of artificial intelligence. And AI, the modern incarnation of deep learning anyway, started in 2012 with uh, a little program by Alex Kruszewski called AlexNet. And since that time, we've really progressed in complexity. We're not just uh, creating and training these AI networks. We are using AI to search for new AI algorithms. So it's getting very, very meta. And when you use AI upon AI, it's a double exponential. It takes a huge amount of processing power. And we've had essentially a 300,000x growth in the computing uh, needs for artificial intelligence. Now, how do computers get faster? Well, computers get faster via this famous thing called Moore's Law. And on a relative scale, you can see Moore's Law has only increased by just shy of 10x over this time period. So we have this massive gap between the performance we need and the performance that we have. So, so that is really why we need AI hardware. So 300,000x. How have we even managed so far? Because if you notice this chart, it is in the present. It is not in the future. So in some, by some miracle, we have managed to keep up. Well, there are three axes of improvement that we can use and we've been using since the dawn of silicon chips. One is transistor scaling. That's just a technical term for Moore's law. Um, between 2012 and 2017, there's been about a 7x improvement in transistor scaling. Moore's law, you will often he read or hear that it is dying or is dead. It hasn't died. It's just gotten a lot more expensive, but we're still pushing along. The new iPhone that you will get this year, so in October, uh, will be on uh, TSMC's latest process and will be benefiting from Moore's law again. So from transistor scaling, we've gotten about 7x um, improved chip architecture. What does that mean? That means when you take the transistors, that's your budget, that's your stuff, you can lay it out in different ways. One way may be very performant. Um, another way may be very slow. Um, if you lay it out in you know, a graph core way, you might get really great performance and, and communication on top as well. So being smart about how you design the chip gives you a lot of performance. And here is this, this weird, funny-looking diagram is NVIDIA's Tensor Core, which is um, the fastest uh, GP, uh, AI processor you can actually buy today. Uh, that's given us about 12x since NVIDIA's Fermi architecture. And the last thing is just, just deploying more servers, throwing more iron and throwing more money at the problem. And oddly enough, that's actually been the primary driver of performance. Um, we've gone, gained about 128x from that. Um, how do we know that? Well, if you look at Alex Krzyzewski, the first deep learning computer, it probably looks something like this. You had one of these back in the day. It's, um, it's a PC. Uh, here it's a gaming PC. It has two graphics cards you can see there. Uh, and these were really made for playing video games. I mean, how, how many people play video games here? Any Xbox, PlayStation? 
All right, when the AI revolution is over, you will know that you made a huge contribution to AI because this is, this is the basis. This is how it all started. So this is the first deep learning computer, um, and it obviously has caught on fire. So Google became interested in 2016. They built the first chip designed specifically for AI. Their first application was AlphaGo, which made huge waves. And it looks something like this, you know, two racks, not too intimidating. A year later, it, it grew a lot, right? Uh, they, they increased the chip so that it doesn't just play kind of AlphaGo doing inference. Uh, you can train the chip as well, basically doing what NVIDIA chips uh, were the only ones that could do at the time. So this is TPU2 from a year ago. And this year at Google I.O., they announced a system that's eight times faster than that. Uh, it is looking really, really scary. So the chips didn't get a lot smarter. They, they did get smarter. The silicon didn't get, the transistors didn't shrink that much, though, though they did. But the number of servers that we're putting out now um, has become monstrous, which has really shifted the power of AI um, from the people, the solar researchers from a Canadian university who might be able to make a breakthrough um, in their spare time to these mega corporations who have billions of dollars of R&D and CapEx who, who can invest in data centers like this. This is just one of them. We don't know how many Google has. Um, and the performance of this system is on the order of about 100 petaflops. The most powerful supercomputer in the world that was just announced last week is 200 petaflops. So two of these are roughly the same order of magnitude as the fastest supercomputers in the US Department of Energy. So that's the power of kind of the internet players today. So we have this problem. Um, how do we close the gap? Well, um, there are certain things we can do um, and, and certain things we can't. But I think primarily within our near-term or medium-term horizon, we need much better chips. So what's on the menu chip-wise? Um, we have four primary options today. We have CPUs. And, and it's, it's interesting that these were invented roughly uh, across every decade. CPUs came out in the 70s. This is when we first learned how to take transistors and put them on a single chip instead of just having them um, scattered across a board. Transistors used to be kind of like grains of rice, and you wire them together with, with, with metal wiring. Um, Intel, um, um, along with others, figured out how to put that in a single package, and the wires shrunk, the transistor shrunk, everything became faster. That was the most important breakthrough probably um, in, in chip manufacturing. Um, FPGAs are, are something that's kind of exotic. They came around in the 80s, and they're really for simulating hardware. Uh, they're used in communications and, and satellites and 5G networks and so on. The great thing about FPGAs is they're reprogrammable. So once the CPU is done, once it comes out of the factory, it's baked. It's, it's set in stone. Um, the FPGA is almost like a, is something that you can, you can remold again. Um, you basically uh, download some software on it, and you can make it behave and process any kind of workload you want. The, the drawback is it takes a lot of, you need to be kind of a super genius to be able to do that. The GPUs came out in the 90s because everyone in the 90s was playing video games. And uh, video games turns out to be a really, really hard problem. Um, the first video games were, were like cartoons. Uh, then they became kind of like plastic looking people. And now when you play Gears of War, you have some really realistic looking stuff. So these chips are not to scale, but they sort of give you a sense of relative size. Um, GPUs, when they first came out, weren't very sophisticated, because, but gamers were so hungry, they had such appetites for realistic graphics, that GPUs became very quickly the largest chips uh, that, that um, the, the major chip factories pump out today. If you remember Silent Slide with, uh, with the, the size of the optical um, limit, 825 millimeters, NVIDIA's latest GPU is right up to that limit. Uh, they literally cannot make it a bit bigger because then it's like it would be bigger than the film that you're exposing, so it wouldn't work at all. So GPUs have become very large, and today um, basically 99% of the deep learning training creating these AI algorithms, whether you're at Google or Facebook, uh, is done on GPUs, and they're the ones to beat. The latest series of, uh, I guess, architecture to come out is uh, TPUs, or tensor processing units. Um, I broadly label them TPUs. Uh, I, I, I consider something like a graph core chip along this, in the same rough family. And uh, this, the first production units came out uh, you know, two or three years ago with, with Google. Uh, Google has a very unique play in this. Why do they, Google is a search company. Why are they making chips? Um, Google is also in the cloud business. And in the cloud business, Amazon and Microsoft have basically taken over that business. If you're a major enterprise uh, company today and you want to deploy some services in the cloud, you're going to basically deploy on Amazon, and maybe you have some existing software you would just deploy on Azure. And Google kind of got left in the dust, even though 
it was really their uh, game to win. They are the, the original kind of cloud uh, software company. So they want you to use their cloud, and they need a reason for you to use their cloud, so they develop these TPUs. TPUs give uh, really high performance for certain deep learning applications. And um, with that, they can advertise and say, hey, if you want the fastest deep learning or the latest uh, networks, uh, please come to our cloud, which is why they built these TPUs. It's also helped them to win these great uh, 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 games such as Go. So these four are on the menu. And I'd like to give a, a couple of ways of looking at it, since uh, it may seem a little exotic. So one way to look at it is just across uh, use cases and uh, where these devices end up. Um, you can have it in the cloud, or you can have it in the device. All of you probably have a deep learning computer in your pocket right now. That's your, uh, that's your smartphone. And it can do a limited amount of, of inference. So uh, anyone on the iPhone can search for pictures of, of uh, pasta or salad or mozzarella. And it would actually search through your iPhone library because it's been trained against these categories uh, to find them. So even if you didn't tag the photos, uh, if you ate at a restaurant three weeks ago, it would actually uh, find it for you, which is a, which is a great feature. You can, have Jeep, you can have these chips in the cloud. And in the cloud, they're really used to answer every search query um, on any internet device. Just to give you a sense of how far the applications have grown, 10 years ago, if you had put in a query into Google, um, it did a page rank search, a fairly simple algorithm was on a CPU, and that was it. Uh, if you went on Twitter, it gave you the latest tweet that came out on your timeline. All the workload were, were very straightforward. Today, those exact workloads have grown so much in complexity because of deep learning. If you, use, if you use Google Search today and you put in a term, it gets sent basically through um, um, a panel of experts of which the third most influential one is called BrainRank, which is a deep learning algorithm designed to return you the right answer. If you search on Twitter, uh, the timeline is not ordered by uh, the latest tweet. The timeline is classified by the most relevant thing to you. Um, and that's using a deep learning as well. And on Netflix, when you open it, it's not just A-B alphabetical movies uh, listed in that order. It is movies using deep learning, neural collaborative filtering designed specifically uh, for the movies that they think you will watch first and watch for the longest amount of hours. That reduces their churn, uh, which helps their business. So every single um, modern internet service has become a inference problem in the cloud, this box um, uh, for inference in cloud. And perhaps the most exciting and, and uh, fastest growing market right now is, is training, and that really only happens in the cloud. NVIDIA GPUs have most of the share, uh, and Google basically takes the rest uh, with their TPUs. On the device side, um, the iPhone chip is really an SOC, or system on chip. That's just basically a term for CPU, GPU, uh, modem, munched together into a single chip to save power. Um, that's an interesting opportunity that hasn't really, I think, been talked about here very much because there are more of those devices than, uh, than any of the others. So I'll skip on to this one, which will give you a sense of that. Um, the, the amount of training you can have, uh, roughly speaking, these are all uh, an order of magnitude apart. Training requires about 10 petaflops. Inference requires maybe one petaflop, and device inference is, is just under one. Um, the device inference section, you'll notice that there are just more units. There are 10 billion smartphones out there, something, something on that order, uh, whereas training servers are, are few, far fewer. So these are the AI chip companies in 2018. Um, this is not even a complete list. This, this market has grown so quickly that this list becomes outdated the second I push the slide onto Twitter. But if you do follow on Twitter, you'll, you'll get the latest version. Um, you notice that basically it's the US and China that, that are leading the effort. Um, it's great to see some representation in the, in the UK and, and France as well. OK, so the TPU strategy uh, has been adopted by Google and Intel Nirvana and GraphCore and so on. Um, how has it played out? Well, the, the original strategy I think was great, which was to introduce these four new features that were not found on GPUs, mixed precision, high-speed interconnect, unpackaged memory, uh, and tensor cores. Uh, graph core does not have unpackaged uh, memory. They have it on chip. Uh, and it was a great strategy. The issue is it is a moving target when you're competing against NVIDIA. NVIDIA didn't have any of that in 2012. By 2016, they had two of those features on their Pascal chip. And by 2017, they had all of them. So the TPU strategy is now um, in a really precarious situation because it is against a product that is shipping and already has the bulk of the features. 
NVIDIA, in case you don't know, I covered them since the late 90s. They were probably the most ferociously competitive company in the world. This is what their landscape on the eve of their IPO. They were competing against companies 10 times, 100 times their market capitalization. A couple of years later, everyone is either acquired, bankrupt, or exited, including IBM and Intel. So final slide, how do we scale performance another 100,000 times? Um, I think definitely we're going to use Moore's law. It's going to come because there's just huge industry momentum built around it. Um, maybe there's 10, 15 years left, but you cannot depend on it. It won't be alone. It won't be enough to take us there. TPU-based designs or better architectures based on transistors are fine, but I don't think at this point it's sufficient to supplant NVIDIA because NVIDIA can basically build whatever design you can build unless you choose to be really, really different. Software doesn't get talked about enough. There's probably at least 100x performance in software. Even if you compare the first versions of the software libraries, NVIDIA and Intel shipped versus the current version, there's just 10x of performance there. So we've got a lot of way to go for software. I think more efficient algorithms is probably the most um, uh, uh, promising in terms of how much uh, it can provide. We can do one-shot learning, which reduces the number of samples we need. Today, we need 1,000 examples. If we can shrink it to one, that's a 1,000x improvement. There are new ways of training ResNets, like superconvergence, that's 10 times faster. So that's very promising. Um, but I'm a huge fan of new substrates, optical, um, analog, or quantum. I think these are what's needed to take us beyond Moore's law. And finally, you know, if all else fails, uh, the existing systems will, will, will keep up in place. Um, we can scale up, which is to put more chips in a server. NVIDIA's latest one has 16. And we can scale out, which is to build more servers Google style. But that's going to put things in the favor of the internet guys. And uh, I think we want more democratization here. All right. Thank you. <laughs>